Oag has been involved with landscapes for decades, and they use an approach called integrated landscape management. It's also known as ILM. It's a concept that I imagine a lot of folks here are familiar with. Uh, it's all about collaboration between lots of different sectors over a whole region with a goal of overcoming challenges like biodiversity, loss, poverty, climate change, food insecurity, and, and much, much more. Um, ILM uh, can be a solution to many of the world's biggest challenges, and that's why we are coming together today to explore how ILM is going to progress into the future. This year also marks EcoAg's 20th anniversary. For the next year, they are going to bring together voices from all these landscapes, from farmers to scientists to policymakers, government officials, financiers, community leaders. And they ask that you join them as they continue in their mission of harnessing collaboration to implement robust, sustainable development that restores nature while fighting rural inequality and poverty. And you can learn more by following the link in the chat. And Isabel is going to put that, that link in the chat there right now. Um, so let's introduce our speakers. Uh, we have some of the most foremost visionaries, experts in their field who have made substantial contributions in the landscape sphere. Um, and I'm going to ask each of them to give a brief introduction of yourselves. Uh, let's start with Emil. Hello, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, I am Emil Frison. I am a senior advisor to the Agroecology Coalition and a member of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems and a former Director General of Biodiversity International Research Organization dealing with agricultural biodiversity. Thank you. How about you, Kirsten? My name is Kirsten Danlop. I am also based in, I'm based in the Netherlands. Um, I lead an organization called Climate Kick, uh, EIT Climate Kick. The Kick stands for Knowledge Innovation Community. We are Europe's foremost agency and community for uh, climate innovation and action. And our specialization is to look at systemic change. How do we harness and unlock and design innovation in such a way that it's able to support large scale place based transformation that is holistic and systemic? Um, and, and much of our work in over the last year, 15 years, has been in food systems, soils, forestry, land use, agriculture, and taking a landscape view. Perfect. Thank you. How about you, Peter? Oh, you're muted, Peter. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. I am Peter Minam. I'm speaking from Nairobi. I'm the director for Africa for C4 and eCraft. Um, our work is really about bringing trees into the landscape and on farms to, to help transform lives and landscapes. And I'm really passionate about it. My recent it, it, uh, interest is in the intersection between poverty, climate change, and, and landscape approaches. And I'm and, and happy to be to be here because I've been working with uh, EcoAg partners for a long time. Thanks. Perfect, thank you. And speaking of EcoAg, Sarah, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you very much, Nate. And it's so great to have all of you with us today. I'm the currently the president and CEO of Eco Agriculture Partners, which is an action research center that was started 20 years ago to try to um, align agricultural development practice with environmental management and uh, social well-being. Um, and we work in policy, we work on um, technical assistance to farmers, um, and we also work on finance. So uh, we want to, uh, I'm also the chair of the 1000 Landscapes for 1 Million People Initiative, which I may chat with you about a little bit later today. But by training, I'm an agriculture and resource economist. Um, and I'm based outside Washington, D.C. in Virginia and the United States. Great. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for joining us. I'm really excited about these this uh, uh, these questions and, and, and learning more and hearing more from all, all of you. Um, the way this is going to work is I've got a series of questions. We'll kind of do a roundtable. Um, I'll kind of just pick people to, uh, to start off. And I think, Sarah, I'm going to start with you, if you don't mind, um, with this first question. So integrated landscape management is becoming kind of a quote unquote hot solution among land use, climate development professionals. But most policymakers still don't know about it or, or get why it's important. So how would you explain ILM in a way that gets average folks and policymakers excited? Sure, I will give that a try. Uh, 
ILM is about how different actors in the landscape, the farmers, environmentalists, government, business people, community leaders, in, in what we call a landscape, which is the, the place where people interact with their resource base, but it's also called a territory, a bioregion, a seascape, there's many, many words for it, but it's where they collaborate to achieve long-term sustainable development and resilience. Um, in the face of resource degradation, the climate crisis, poverty, economic problems and crises, they don't choose paralysis, they don't choose despair. They come together um, collectively to try to regenerate their people, their nature, their economy, and to rekindle hope in their landscapes for the future. That's wonderful. How about you, Peter? You know, I, I think adding on to, to what Sarah said, I think it, it is perhaps one of the best ways of reconciling, you know, environmental objectives, development objectives, and, and social objectives in a given space, because that's the one way through which we can achieve sustainability. Otherwise, if you're not taking an ILM approach and, and bringing all of these things together with a common future, a sustainable one, then there are higher chances of being less successful with 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 uh, other approaches. Emil, do you have anything to add? I I always like to start by saying uh, that the current sectoral approaches that have been dominant and that unfortunately are still dominant in many places have been leading us to where we are today, which is a failure to address many of the problems that we are facing today. And so integrated landscape management is really bringing together all the stakeholders in order to find solutions that minimize trade-offs and maximize synergies. And I think that's to me a, a powerful message that, that can help convince people. That's great. Kirsten? I double click on integrated. I, uh, I think everything that's been said, what I would really add into that is there is an element around um, progressing beyond sectoral thinking and sectoral approaches uh, into the space of deeply collaborative uh, partnership um, that requires two orders of integration that is so important in integrated landscape management. One is the integration of multiple scales from and multiple levels from very, very small holdings or small kind of parcels of land and land and land kind of relationship up to large order scales of where where regions have resources flowing in, flowing out, and how nutrients are held. And the other is an integration of thinking about interdependency. So it's a way of bringing together learning from nature to take an ecological perspective and think in terms of ecosystem services and extend that logic to human settlements and human interdependence and relationship with land so that we do start to think of who provides nutrients to whom and how and how do we really understand some of those services not as two separate worlds of people and nature but as a fundamentally intertwined and interdependent set of of exchanges perfect and as a as a follow-up kirsten what, what what's changed over the past 20 years that has made people more aware of the value of integrated landscape management? I think uh, very much to what Emil was saying, the, the, the this, a steady stream of evidence of failure, of thinking in sectors, in silos, in, in, in kind of individual interests and not taking a landscape view. I think we have so many, we have consistently seen the unintended consequences of interventions, or we've seen missed opportunities to, to shift from incremental transformation or incremental change or incremental fixes to something that's much more self-sustaining and re inherently regenerative. We've only just started to really train ourselves on the idea of what regeneration looks like and how much of a bigger story that is than human control models um, tell us. And we are now, what's changed dramatically in the last 20 years is a steady stream of, in, of, of evidence that the land, the land, the climactic conditions, the state of soil, 
the conditions of plants, even just level levels of CO2 and sugars in plants, all sorts of things are dramatically changing. So we're, we have a kind of galloping change in the physical world and its physical effects and the evidence of that, and a slower growing realization that that in fact has a hell of a lot to do with our inability to see it as a whole and to see as a set of interdependent effects and our our attachment to trying to see things in pieces and manage them in individual fragments. So that tension is probably what I would call out as the biggest single change, the tension between the evidence of a material change that farmers in, in the midst of Africa are able to name but can't necessarily connect up to the, a huge global political system of fragmented action and a really gro slow growing and kind of divergent realization that the way we're doing this is is making the problem worse and worse and worse. And Peter, I'm curious if you've seen that then as well um, on the continent of Africa. Um, absolutely. I mean, if you look at particularly climate change, uh, the evidence of the 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 way climate change is touching on each sector and the way uh, various sectors are also contributing to an impact in climate change in the way we've done business. You know, with growing agriculture, we see deforestation rising and emissions increasing and therefore contributing to climate change. We see with temperatures rising, agriculture being the most impacted uh, on the land, but also water connecting to that being impacted. So with climate change being more evident with more floods, more droughts, you know, connected to land degradation in itself and deforestation. It's, it's overwhelmingly evident to everyone at the moment that um, climate change is a real marker of the fact that all of these things are connected. It's a complex of issues that have to be addressed with, in a holistic way uh, to find solutions. If we, if we keep trying to do it in pieces, it, it's a recipe for, for failure, basically. So looking at, at where we are, I think in Africa at the moment, climate change has really demonstrated with overwhelming evidence and impact that you know, we need to go through a pathway that, that is wholesome, that looks at the solutions in, in an interconnected way. And I think integrated landscape management is probably the most, the most viable approach to that. And Sarah, I'm kind of curious if you've seen something similar here in North America as well. I think you've really seen a big change in North America. Um, people don't talk about it as much, but there's been a real growth of integrated landscape management across the United States. And I think the biggest change is that people don't anymore think about ecosystem degradation, biodiversity loss, and climate change as somehow problems for nature. Um, maybe in the past, they, they appreciated nature, but it wasn't really a priority for them. But now their own experience is showing them how dependent people's health and their livelihoods and the economy are on healthy ecosystems. And it's not just the floods and the wildfires and the infectious disease spread that's so much in the news. It's the water shortages that are affecting the economics of a water bottling plant or climate change shifting where you can grow crops in the Southeast, um, reducing grain production. Um, it's the increased cost of constructing roads and bridges, uh, the higher cost to insulate your buildings. It's, it's not a problem for in the future. It's not a problem for some other place. They're starting to see that right here in the United States, it's happening in their own landscape which is they see they need to coordinate the management of these resources or everybody is going to suffer. So it's a new way of thinking, but it's it's definitely people's lived experiences that's changed this, I think. And how about you, Emil, anything to, to add? Well, I, I come from an agroecology background and there also we've seen an evolution of the thinking about agroecology that was initially more focused on the production side, on, on the farm level, uh, but realizing that just trying to change the production is not going to solve the problems because uh, you need at the same time to change consumption if you want to have a real transformation of your food systems. So 
this broadened the view that uh, agroecology really is covering the entire food system and the, the thinking uh, that has evolved um, mainly since 2014 when um, FAO organized the first symposium on, on agroecology, uh, which was followed up by a, a series of, of regional um, um, meetings in order to develop the basis of this integrated approach to uh, food system transformation by identifying the 10 elements of agroecology that really covered the entire food system. This was then uh, translated into 13 principles by the high level panel of experts on sustainable food systems. And I think that these principles are very well aligned with an integrated landscape management uh, philosophy. Uh, what, what is intended uh, through an agroecological transformation is um, and, and the application of the principles is really to aim for economic, environmental, climate, nutrition, health, social objectives simultaneously, as opposed to what has been the case so far, uh, looking at these things in isolation and often in opposition, where production was being maximized at the expense of the environment, at the expense of health, etc., so I think this, this evolution uh, towards looking at a food system requires an integrated landscape approach uh, because that's where the people, uh, producers, consumers, and all the people in between are meeting, uh, of course. So I, I think that there's a lot of convergence with the evolution that we've seen in agroecological thinking with this emergence of integrated landscape management approaches. So, you know, this this obviously sounds like something that that policymakers are talking about. It's it's a hot topic, as I said earlier. But I'm curious, you know, as, as an environmental journalist, you know, I've I've heard about carbon credits, environmental justice, intersectionality, um, but integrated landscape management isn't something that people in my, my circle talk about. And, you know, it seems really important, but why aren't we hearing about this in the news? And what is it going to take to have this term and this 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 idea become even more widespread? and mainstreamed, if you will, like we hear with carbon credits and things like that. And I'll put that, that question out to, to anyone who feels like answering. I think I, I will have to kind of make a start. I think because what we are talking about is fundamentally a social infrastructure for change. And we have been obsessed with technical, kind of technocratic financial infrastructures for change. Um, and this is, I mean, there is many elements of this that are technical, but deeply technical, and elements that are deeply economic and financial. But fundamentally, this is about a social system change that also reaches into some of our core assumptions about the way in which social order, social systems translate into institutional structures. So, for example, with respect to ownership, ownership of land, forms of ownership. Much of this is really asking us to learn, unlearn a set of assumptions about what is possible, right, and fair, and relearn uh, a, a new set of assumptions about how in which how you put a, a set of mutualistic needs and interests at the center of everything that you do and organize your economic um, and political and, and financial system around that. And if you observe the way in which the world has dealt with climate change, we've dealt with this as a, um, as a scientific problem, a research problem, a technical problem. We have really only now and very, very, and I would say very, very partially been willing to internalize or partially even yet the idea that this is a social problem. It is a human design for life human imagination and human social systems, economic systems problem. So that's why we haven't heard about these. It's also highly complex. This is about talking about multi-sided relationships. And we have been training ourselves for a decent hundred years, not to think in systems, but to think in linear um, compartmental log frames. So we are having to unlearn also that. However, uh, we've got a lot of conditional conditions that are inducing us to think rethink very, very fast. 
So let's hope that that's that's part of what it goes to. But I'd I'd happily pass to Sarah and Mila and Peter on on why well, do you think it's been less known? Well, I'll say something really quick. Um, we have a famous American uh, writer named Mark Twain. Many of you have heard about, it. and one of the characters in one of his books gets very impressed with himself when he discovers that he'd been speaking prose all of his life, because it's not a word that he knew. And all of a sudden he's been speaking prose. And I actually think there's a bit of this in integrated landscape management. Um, I wrote a blog uh, a year or two ago, pleading with the people in this space to start using a common terminology, because I had a list of 100 different terms, everything from territorial management to integrated watershed development to bioregional development. and Everybody thinks each one of those is something different, but they're just a little bit of a different take on the concept of integrated landscape management. So I, I think that the people that are involved, there's a lot more of it going on of people who maybe wouldn't even recognize that what they're doing is, is ILM, but they're working across sectors, they're working across problems, they're integrating, they're thinking spatially, they're thinking long-term. So what they're doing is it, what they're lacking is a professionalization of that, they're lacking a language in which to communicate to others. And um, the plea that I had in this particular blog was, when you're talking to policymakers, show them how what you're doing is linked to what so many others are doing, um, city, city regions, uh, there's so many other verses. So I think if we could, be, we could do much better job of communicating it, what we would find is there's so many, I just learned in one of the, one of the states in the US that there's 60 landscape partnerships going on in that one state that I was only aware of about four of them. Uh, so I think they're all over the place. We just need to talk about them. Journalists need to talk about them, Nate. I, I would like to build up on what, what Kirsten uh, said about the social, uh, the social aspect and, and social transformation that, that has to be an integral part uh, and, and is an integral part of, of successful transformation. And I want to give the example of um, what has happened in Andhra Pradesh, uh, where we have now more than 1 million farmers uh, that have been um, embarking on what they call natural farming, which is the term they use for agroecology. Uh, and this has been really very successful, and I can come back later about uh, describing the, the success. But the point I want to make here is that this has been very successful because it has uh, been uh, building on more than 15 years of uh, initiatives to build social capital, to build uh, the, the kind of community-based organizations that uh, empower people that uh, give them uh, the, the means of working together more efficiently, uh, the women's self-help groups that have been put in place. And uh, in, in the past, too much is, as was mentioned by Kirsten as well, has been on, on technical uh, tricks, on, on changing practices, et cetera. And you realize that unless there is a social transformation at the same time, that often uh, the, the success is not uh, where, it, where, um, where it should be. And uh, it's really embracing at the same time this uh, social innovation and social capital building as an essential element of, of transformation. So I think uh, we must be thinking beyond just uh, changing uh, some technical practices uh, in order to be more environmentally sustainable, for example, towards a real deep transformation that has a very strong social component. That's great. That that uh, that's a perfect transition to my next question. Because you had said, Sarah. Oh, Peter, did you have something that you wanted to add before I before I move on? No, just just go go on. I'll, I'll come later. Please. Oh, okay, okay. Because you had said, Sarah, that you know, um, ILM is is a concept, and 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 you know. There's in some ways you need journalists to tell these stories. And so as a journalist, I'm always looking for an interesting story. And so I wanted to kind of open this up to the panel. Can you share a specific example of where, when, and how ILM has been really successful on a large scale? And I actually want to start with with Peter. So thanks. I, I think that that um, I mean in 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 East Africa, I think one of our most our best examples is 
is the transformation that we saw in Shinyanga in Tanzania. Um, this was a place that was, you know, for 20 years, almost converted to arid land, you know, from intensive agriculture and livestock. And then we started a landscape program with in, in what was called the Hashi program with significant government investment. In fact, government set up a really big institution for that. Um, I mean, ECRAF was in, involved in that directly with some uh, uh, Norwegian funding over a period of about 25 years long. And we got back through uh, introducing traditional systems, the system of, you know, what they call a uh, Gitili system, where they would ring fence the area and allow it to regenerate. So we came in with agroforestry techniques to introduce a bit more tree species, to help develop woodlots, to help also with fodder, fodder trees and fodder plants. Um, and within that period, I can tell you from almost arid land, we got back to a system where 21 of the prominent 56 species, you know, uh, animal species that were in that landscape came back. You know, we got from almost zero carbon in the degraded landscape to something between 25 and 36 tons of carbon per hectare per year in the area. We got from less than, you know, $14 per hectare on farming for those lands to almost $190 per hectare of revenues and benefits, and not even speaking of the, the, the value of the biodiversity and the ecosystem services. And we were able to, to sustain cattle in the land, even in drought periods, because there were, there were fodder trees that could supply food, you know, feed for cattle during that time. It was a complete transformation economically, you know, uh, 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 environmentally. And the most important thing I would say, going back to what Tristan and, and Emil and, and Sarah were saying, it was all built on the traditional institutions of the Sukuma people. This was a practice that they were doing before that were, was abandoned and we sort of resuscitated and promoted that. And, and that transformed the landscape. And, and you had all the institutions, government working together with all the actors, you know, um, um, government livestock institutions, uh, ECRAF was involved in that. And it, that example really is for me, one of the best examples that we need to showcase and going back to the first question that the other, the previous question, that there is a huge return on investment from a development, from a climate, from a biodiversity perspective, you know, from a poverty reduction perspective in landscape approaches. Thank you. That's wonderful. And Amelia, you had mentioned a, uh, a project a little bit earlier. Um, I'm wondering if you wanted to expand yep. on that. Yes, uh, I, I think uh, this is by far the, the largest initiative of, of really having transformed uh, entire communities and, and landscapes towards sustainable, <laughs> resilient uh, and, and performing um, agriculture and food systems. Um, what, what is remarkable there uh, is that um, a recent study that was uh, comparing uh, communities that have embarked on transformation uh, through natural farming with others that have continued what I would call chemical input agriculture, uh, contrary to what is often claimed, uh, productivity increased by 11% in average. But what is even more important is that the net income increased by 50% on average and in some cases, much, even much more. And uh, this is really uh, allowing for, for a real durable uh, transformation. But in addition, it, they, the study didn't just look at uh, the economic performance, but also looked at the impact on health. And what was shown is that in communities that have uh, moved to natural farming or ag agroecology, they had 
30% less expenditure on health. And they had about one third also less days of work because of disease. So this really shows a, a very significant impact of uh, positive impact on health of this transformation. Uh, it also showed uh, a much increased biodiversity in these agricultural landscapes with large numbers of birds, uh, insects coming back, uh, pollinators, uh, a much greater diversity uh, of, of wild species in agricultural landscapes and showing really the integrated approach of uh, maximizing biodiversity within agricultural landscapes, the, the, the land sharing approach, uh, which shows to be uh, very, very efficient. So there is, is a very good example of um, what can be done uh, taking this approach. And one other indicator, uh, you've all heard about the large numbers of su farmers' suicides in India. Uh, well, we are now talking there about a community of, of more than one million, so it's a significant number, and there hasn't been a single suicide in farmers that have converted. I think this is, to me, a very, very uh, meaningful indicator on what uh, what this can what can be achieved. That's pretty amazing, Neil. No, yeah. no suicides. Um, Kirsten, what about you? Well, maybe let me uh, describe something which is a little bit more emergent um, in a context like Europe, where you have a lot of established practices to overcome. And uh, um, there's an initiative that has been uh, that is actually anchored from the Netherlands, started from there, but is run by Ashoka Netherlands and Commonland um, together, and is um, it's called bio weaving. Um, uh, no, how do I, I need to remember the precise name, um, but it's bioweaving labs. Yeah, the, 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 and it's really about bioregions that is working across another, a number of different regions across Europe from, from Ireland, Netherlands, Spain, Austria, um, uh, Germany, and so on. All of them with actually very, very different uh, realities and challenges. In the Netherlands, a lot of that has been about soils and the use of peatland over decades to nurture rich agricultural production that's then been over exaggerated and over industrialized. And you now have kind of deserts almost literally of peatland, um, not dissimilar in, in Ireland um, versus Spain, where you've got some of the, it's a region, the region that's involved is one of the most arid areas in Europe and, and the water humidity is, is getting worse and worse in terms of projections and unreliability. And this is really about, it's like, it's applying the principles of, of, uh, of ILM to ways in which you design a system of orchestrators of this kind of work who are working across multiple places uh, and are working to connect, to convene, to educate, to provide tools, to provide evidence bases, to particularly to create the kind of accelerated learning environments where one community learns from another because they learn together rather than kind of a drier resource of case studies that you can't really apply. So it's a much more dynamic process of learning. So this notion of bioregional weaving is on the one hand taking inspiration um, from kind of core systems thinking about how and why to think, not just of a region as a political space or a cultural space, but as a, a, an integrate relationship with a biological sphere. And secondly, to think about the notion of how you literally weave together a whole set of integrated elements that are social, economic, cultural, um, fiscal, financial, regulatory, to make it possible to put into place this much more holistic, integrated approach. So it's it started to, formally. It started in 2022. So it's still kind of it has an, a deliberate 10 year arc, but it builds on work in many places, like in the Netherlands, where you have an area with um, uh, an initiative called De Platzen that has for many years looked at how would you look at a much more effective way of handling soil and soil regeneration. So it's building up and around. Um, but I'd probably say that's it's an example of, as you were naming before, the beginnings of 
not yet quite mainstreaming, but the beginnings of noticing that this has this way of thinking about land, land use, land relationships, and land practices, and taking a landscape view has significant social benefits, but significant resiliency benefits. And that's increasingly becoming something that is gradually entering into consciousness as, as, as a positive investment. That's wonderful. How about you, Sarah? No, it's really exciting to hear about all these landscapes. And Xinyang, it was one of the very first landscapes that I visited when I first moved to Africa back in 1985. It's been amazing to see the change there. Um, I'm going to take a little, I think I'm the example. I've seen so many incredibly inspiring and amazing landscape initiatives around the world of all types. Um, but I'm noticing that the examples we've got today are very much from some uh, very intensively settled, intensive farming areas, the one that Emil was describing, major crop, crop livestock systems um, that that Peter was describing these these this variety of European advanced agriculture systems, and I thought I'd maybe shift to a different kind of an example, um, which I I really love and found really inspiring in the Sierra Gorda uh, Biosphere Reserve in Mexico. So um, the reserve of over 370,000 hectares, it's very large, um, and it was formally established in 2001, and it's the only protected area in Mexico that was it, that was mobilized by grassroots organization who asked the government to set it up as a reserve. They had spent decades fighting against their resources, not a high density area, it's an indigenous area, uh, but after decades of fighting against outsiders, that were exploiting and destroying their resource base, the local people joined together to try to get protection legally by collaborating with the government, but they wanted to use it to develop an economy that would protect and regenerate the extraordinarily biodiverse fauna and flora and culture of their uh, this very mountainous highland region. It really is extraordinary, everything from jaguars to butterflies to everything. But, and over the last 25 years, uh, they've been convened by a group called Sierra Gorda Ecological Group. It's an NGO that's been the facilitator of this initiative, the BioWeaver, uh, to use the terms that Kirsten was saying. And they have been setting up not only things like nature protection and reforestation committees and an extensive program of environmental education that has had 170 schools, 18,000 children involved, but they've been setting up economic enterprises. They've set up more than 100 recycling centers that are that are set up and managed by women who earn the, earn the income from them. Um, they've been setting up uh, they've, a, a really interesting ecotourism route that celebrates all the different aspects of their food culture and their biodiversity and been using this for local uh, income generation. Um, they've also been setting up a, a large number of small enterprises. They've been seeding that with funds they've received from different, different parts of the world and they've paid them back quickly. Um, experimenting with farmers, they've developed a whole range of agroecological practices uh, to restore their quite degraded crop and lives and grazing lands. Um, and they've set up farmer training centers across the landscape that are now being used as a model, not only across Mexico, but it's actually spreading all over Latin America as, as a sort of a peer-to-peer -peer learning model. Um, since these practices, these agroecological practices also stored a lot of carbon underground and in the soils and in the vegetation and in the agroforestry systems, they did research over two decades on the impacts on the carbon emissions and carbon sequestration and how to design a carbon payment system that would actually benefit farmers because most of the carbon payment systems out there aren't very good for local farmers, especially smallholders. So in 2022, this carbon measurement system that they set up was officially adopted by the government of Mexico as a local protocol in Mexico's national nationally appropriate mitigation actions, NAMA, which is under the UN Climate Change Convention. Um, and then they not only did that, but they then partnered with the state government of Querétaro, that the state government that wanted to become more environmentally friendly, set up a tax on transport in some other sectors. And the funding from that tax was reinvested with farmers and grazers and forest managers in Sierra Gorda. So it's been really exciting. So it's becoming a sort of a sustainable source of funding for investing in landscapes. And they've also set up other payments for ecosystem services. And this is now being done on thousands of, of, of hectares of smallholder farms uh, within Sierra Gorda. 
So, so really the impact of this has been really significant. Um, they've shifted from a trajectory of quite significant and accelerated degradation, turned it around and impoverishment, turned it around to regeneration of, of people, you know, nature and the economy. Uh, more than 34,000 people uh, in, have been involved in uh, various activities, the ones that I've described. So I, I would consider it one a, a very exciting um, sort of a success story. Um, most landscapes haven't reached a point where you can really say they're fully regenerated, but this is such a clear case of, of, of shifting trajectory that it's very inspiring. So we've talked about some of the success stories, and now I want to talk a little bit about obstacles. You know, uh, as an environmental journalist, uh, working in the United States, I see rampant climate misinformation, not only from my neighbors here in Montana, but also when you look at the Republican Party, um, you know, and I'm curious, is that something that you all are seeing? Like, what are some of the biggest obstacles you see in the next 20 years to getting ILM to be more, I guess, quote unquote, mainstreamed? And I'll open that up to, to anybody who, who wants to start. Well, I can start from, from, from my perspective. Um, we really have seen an explosion of these initiatives around the world, thousands and thousands of them. And that's very exciting. And we've also seen a growing number of programs. But in general, there is very little institutional support to people who want to put this together. Uh, they can't get training. They can't get funding. They, they, they have to deal with regulations across multiple sectors, and they are completely not aligned with one another. So their integrated strategy faces so much an uphill uh, ipogal. Policy does not support them. They work together and develop a really robust strategy for long-term regeneration. And then some new government program comes in or some company comes in and completely sort of tears it, completely diverts it uh, from its attention. Um, unless you're super lucky, like you're part of a United Nations agency program, that's because there's some that have really gotten into landscapes uh, or some particularly NG, big NGO that helps you, you're kind of all on your own. Um, and so I, I, I think they're invisible. I think we need a, a, a we really need a major system of long-term institutional support by government and non-government organizations that, that embraces these long-term priorities that are being established by these, these territorial actors, economic, social, environmental, and that can help organize the flow of funds, not sector by sector, private, public, everything being fragmented, but some integrated strategy of financing so you can actually achieve transformational change at scale. Perfect. How about you, Kirsten? Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Peter. No, I mean, I, I sort of see three things as, as top on the list, and some of them related to what Sarah was talking about. The first thing is, I think, despite the fact that we've had so many of these initiatives, one of the things that we've not been great at is really documenting, quantifying what the benefits are. And because we are not quantifying what the benefits are, we are not making a business case for investment. Whether these investments are coming from national governments in domestic investments or coming from the private sector, there is a real shortage of evidence because our monitoring systems are not strong enough that we don't have enough data to convince invest people to invest and, and provide the support that is needed. I, I think my second point is that when you look at the landscape um, of, of landscape actors, there is something that I characterize as the missing middle. And the missing middle is the small, agile, um, um, sub-national level NGO actor that is, is close to the, the local people. As Sarah was saying, this kind of group hardly has any access to training. They don't have access to funding. And as long as we don't have that, that middle group, then what we have are extremely good examples from international NGOs, really good institutions, but then we don't see them rapidly replicated across. So the scaling up then is then blocked by the absence of this 
missing middle of 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 medium to small scale uh, NGO and civil society organizations with the know-how to sort of move this forward, I think. And number three, largely, I think that the, 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 the and it relates to what Sarah said, I think the incentives for landscape approaches, really uh, the incentives for cross-sectoral uh, actions, plus cross-sectoral uh, uh, um, activities are largely absent, whether you're looking at it from uh, uh, a global or uh, a, a national uh, or a sub-national level, we don't have sufficient incentives. The incentives that we currently have are, are incentives, financial incentives for very, you know, focused specific things and not necessarily for doing the complex interactive, you know, social processes that we need to succeed with landscapes. I'll, I'll stop there. Perfect, that's great. Emil? Hey, you're, you're muted. Sorry, I'm muted. I uh, can bring in two other points. Uh, one is still this difficulty of breaking down the sectoral silos within ministries, um, uh, within governments, uh, where different ministries really uh, have great difficulty in reaching out uh, beyond their uh, sectoral responsibilities. Uh, and that, that's an essential... Um, uh, that that is essential to really an integrated landscape management approach is is to um, be able to bring the various sectors together and think about integrated policies that will then allow these developments on the ground. The second uh, obstacle I see, and it's it's often an, an elephant in the room that is is not uh, openly mentioned, but which is not insignificant, and that is. Uh, vested interests that want to maintain the status quo. Uh, I, I can give some concrete examples. Uh, the lobbying that is being done to maintain uh, synthetic fertilizer subsidies, for example. Uh, this is a real uh, drain on, on resources from uh, ministries of agriculture. In some countries, 75% uh, of the budget of the agricultural ministry is going to fertilize the subsidies. And of course, that money at the end of the day is in the pocket of the company that is selling the fertilizer uh, and is a real obstacle to the kind of transformation of systems that is necessary. Uh, and there, there, are, there are other examples, but, but there are real vested interests that actively are undermining transformation, and we must face that uh, equally. I think maybe I would, I, I absolutely um, would reinforce all of the perspectives, the, the lack of institutional structures and forms, the, the challenge of without an evidence base that looks like the type of evidence that we, we like to, that the system currently likes to see, because that's the problem. It's not that there isn't evidence. It doesn't just, it just doesn't look like our current way of measuring outcomes and a lack of integrated policy. It's very hard to do this. My build on this would be uh, a couple of things, foremost amongst which context. Uh, we are in overshoot beyond 1.5 degrees already. So when we really start to realize the implications of a two and a three degree warmed world, then the, the, some of the biggest obstacles are chaos, are literally social and, and social stability breaking down, social and economic tipping points, food systems collapse and crisis, water systems collapse and crisis, and very, very significant volatility. So no, it's, it's not even the kind of thing where you can say, well, you know exactly what will happen where, you don't. Now, on the one hand, this integrated landscape management actually offers a texture of resilience that is inherent and much more likely to, to cope with that kind of volatility and change and kind of dramatic shifts in circumstance. But then that needs to be gradually realized that, that this kind of approach is more likely to work in the kind of radical uncertainty volatility we have. But I think understanding for example, that incentive systems to support 
uh, integrated landscape approaches can be and should be drawn from financial resources seeking to manage climate adaptation resilience and health and emissions reductions, because all of those things meet all together in this one nexus of trying to work in a different way. So for me, there's a there's the, the, the very real obstacle of how quickly the world in which we are inhabiting is changing and what that's going to mean and the extent to which those working across the world, the explosion of different approaches can team up quickly enough to form a network that is resilient because it is learning and kind of holding that space for doing things differently. I think the other the other elements are a little bit one very much to do with something I mentioned early earlier, which really is linked to this problem of sectors and silos, ministries that are managing their own budget, um, decision making and financing of all sorts, whether it's philanthropy or it's project finance from development banks or it's venture capital. Everything is operating in the fragmented sectoral verticals that we have got the world patterned into. So it's incredibly difficult to resource the layer or the kind of the effort of orchestrating systemic change. But it is also very difficult to um, speed up the unlearning of thinking and working in compartments and facing into complexity and say, well, this is too complex. Let's break it down into parts and manage it in parts as opposed to say, that's not a bug, that's a feature. Let's learn and, and accelerate our systems literacy to understand how to use and work with complex dynamic systems because they have enormously powerful exponential effects if we're willing to understand that it's a different way of thinking and acting. And that, I think the last obstacle I would name is institutional. I, uh, we have forms, we have notions around ownership of land that are not compatible with what we're talking about here. Unwinding some of the core, and that's the problem. Companies can come in because they own the rights to, and they can push out who's occupying, as opposed to changing and really working in stewardship, fair hold instead of freehold, kind of stewardship models that start to give people more certainty in the ability to sustain what they're doing over time and not have the rug ripped out from under their feet, metaphorically. Um, so some of those institutions, and that goes to financial institutions, starting to think about how do we create bioregional development banks that offer differential lending rates to those who are working in this way because it's more inherently socially resilient, uh, physically resilient, economically resilient, and therefore it should start to have positive incentives. But it requires a new institutional form to achieve that. Perfect. Great. Well, we've got one last question. I'm going to encourage it to uh, to be brief so we can move on, move on to the uh, the Q&A part of the uh, the webinar. Um, and I just want to state that you'll be able to find additional resources in our follow up email. But how is your organization, your work going to make a difference in the next 20 years? And again, we'll, we'll just ask it to be brief, but I want to do a, a quick round robin. We'll start with Emil. Well, the Agroecology Coalition um, is really uh, bringing together governments with organizations of all types, research organizations, UN organizations, uh, civil society, farmer organizations, indigenous people, and philanthropic foundations to see how we can really accelerate the deep transformation that is necessary throughout our food systems. And uh, we see a very rapid increase in the number of people that are joining. Uh, every week we have several new members joining. And this is something that two years ago I would not have expected. So I, I think that uh, creating a space for really uh, collaboration, uh, cross-learning, uh, which is what the uh, coalition is, is bringing uh, to the table, uh, will be uh, a, a real contributor to the kind of transformation that we want to see happening. And I really would invite those uh, organizations that are not yet member, but believe that this kind of transformation is necessary. I invite them to join the coalition. Uh, you will find the necessary information on our website. Perfect. Thank you so much. Kirsten? Well, I'm trying to sort, so let me choose one example. Um, I just named the challenge of trying to put financial resources behind this kind of work in a sustained way. Uh, one of the things that Clamkick is doing is to instigate an, organ uh, an 
an initiative called the Systemic Climate Action Collaborative, which is an initiative to raise a fund of 1 billion, working across North and South, of unrestricted or flexible patient funds that is explicitly designed to afford and support the very, very integrated weaving systemic work of enabling communities to work at multiple levels, of enabling this kind of social infrastructure change. In other words, to complement a lot of the deep technical work, which is absolutely essential, with the work of joining the dots and coordinating and enabling those on the ground and getting trust-based support to communities on the ground to do this kind of work. And this is about um, an initiative where we are choosing to vote with our feet. So it's it's another 14 organizations together with Climate Kick opting to stop competing to fundraise and to put our capabilities in together so that we can collectively work more effectively in an integrated way. And so that we can find and partner with donors who have similarly concerned that we need to stop saying that things need to go from sectors to systems and actually start to support, financially support and enable that. So that's one of our key elements. And obviously there's a lot that sits with what that enables from policy sandboxing and policy kind of policy coherence to new institutional uh, financial institutions and to shifts in mindsets, practices, skills, professional reskilling to help people do the work and to widen out the model as quickly as possible. So we're kind of voting with our feet to say, we keep naming this problem. How about we put ourselves in the driving seat, make ourselves prototypes of doing working differently and uh, seek to attract uh, donors with a similar shared concern. Perfect, thank you. How about you, Peter? Thanks a lot. I think I think we um, like Kirsten. I think we 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 really are adopting this as a as our mode of working. I think um, besides Yanga, I think I can point to two really good examples. The natural farming example is in, in India is one of those where we are actively involved in in terms of working within that and actually actively showing what it can do. I think one other good example. Of that we are doing is in is in uh, Yangambi in in DRC. It's a fantastic example of of how you can do a landscape approach, bringing in government, bringing in the private sector, and and I think that um, within all of those, we are also ramping up training partnerships with local institutions, so that um, and the expertise is transferred and and people are working. Yeah around this. I think we really are making this the way to go in the future uh, and, and partnering with, with many, many people, including the Co-op and, and also part of the uh, uh, um, coalition. So I, I think this is the way we can demonstrate that bringing in a lot of the evidence base, which is our strength as a, as a, as a research institution. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And Sarah? Uh, sure. Well, I think the, the probably the single most exciting thing we've worked on in the last couple of years at Eco Agriculture Partners has been as the convener of a, an initiative that started in 2019 called 1000 Landscapes for 1 Billion People. And it's a coalition of more than 40 organizations that have already been involved uh, in the design and testing of a suite of services and tools that could be available to these landscape partnerships. We're trying to address that obstacle of lack of institutional support and trying to provide resources that could go directly to landscape partners, but also to, that could go to governments, agencies, NGOs, landscape networks, and others who are trying to support a large number of landscapes in their journey uh, towards, towards transformation. Um, and we've been doing this really, when I say we, this groups, we've got lots of working groups and uh, design teams, um, one that's been working on uh, developing a set of capacity and learning modules uh, that landscape partners can use to help them form their partnership, to help them develop a shared understanding among their, their, their partners, to help develop long-term strategies and short-term action plans in their landscape to get to mobilize funding for them and to, and to assess the impacts of what they're doing. Um, we were also, uh, the, the information technology revolution had bypassed uh, integrated landscape management. And now we're working with a group, um, Tech Matters in Silicon Valley, um, to develop software uh, that can speed up some of these processes and facilitate processes, facilitate communications, facilitate storytelling, 
uh, and you, you can they'll probably put the, the the link to that in the chat. Um, the, our, our partners in, in in this initiative are um, that that got it started. The initial stewards include Rainforest Alliance, Conservation International, uh, Tech Matters. Uh, United Nations Development Program and Common Land, a landscape developer from from the Netherlands that Kirsten referred to. Um, but we're we're working with business groups. We're working with um, landscape networks. We're looking we're working with um, farmer organizations uh, and lots of different groups um, that are needed to build a systemic change across the world. So we're focusing not only on this directly empowering of landscape partnerships, but we've also got a major part of 1,000 Landscape for 1 Billion People, which is about addressing this finance challenge that Kirsten was referring to and looking at ways not only to support landscape partnerships to become better at mobilizing finance from the existing finance system, but to look at these new models of, of integrated landscape finance um, that are starting to, to emerge and, and try to promote them. So uh, this is something we'd actually love for all the folks that are on this uh, webinar here to think about uh, joining us as we as we start the the process of the transformation scaling phase of this initiative. Great, thank you. So now we're going to move on to uh, some questions from the audience, and uh, serendipitously, uh, we have one for Sarah from Graham Wood. Uh, to Sarah's point about needing a common language, is there a discussion in this space about common systems of measurement? My areas of development have suffered because we have no common systems of measurement to compare intervention. Actually, the very first thing we did uh, when we started eco agriculture, one of the first things we did when we started eco agriculture partners after trying to review the scientific evidence uh, for 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 uh, integrated uh, for, for eco agriculture production systems was to look at how do you measure landscapes. It's been a persistent problem, and I would say I actually think we're we're hitting it now. Um, we've now got a framework, um, met metrics and methods that allow us to look at these different dimensions, the economic dimension, the social dimension, the um, uh, the, the sort of health and human well-being uh, dimension, uh, as well as the governance uh, dimension of, of, of landscapes. Uh, we've got tremendously improved tools uh, for doing that. Um, we, we are ourselves working quite a bit with our, our partners um, at Landscale, um, which have actually come up with an impact assessment tool for, for landscapes. Um, th there's a number of, of them around, but I think we've, we're starting to reach a point that really was hard to imagine 20 years ago where we can start tracking landscape um, action over time. And I think uh, we've got some pretty robust frameworks to, for doing beginning to do that. Not that it's easy, but um, it, the issue is getting people to not just look at what they want, they're interested in, but how the thing they're interested to connects with the other things in the landscape. That's where the science gap is. C4 Aircraft is doing a lot of cool work on, on this. Um, but, but even, you know, I think the work Climate Kick is doing on transformation is suggesting probably the next generation of challenge for us is to measure not just changes in states of things, but actually what has, what has changed, what has regenerated, what has transformed. That's the big new area to work on. Wonderful. Um, so our second question, I think I'm just going to open it up to the panel. Um, apart from the need for restructuring social transformation, as Kirsten and Emil explained just now, could the panelists please address whether there is a mechanism by which ILM can be achieved also through or within existing policy frameworks, i.e. a landscape management policy or a plan developed with multi-stakeholder engagement implemented under the administration of something or a cumulative impact assessment, etc.? Well, let me make a stop. Emil is probably going to have more, um, uh, more in-depth knowledge answer to that. I mean, I would build on exactly where Sarah Sarah left off, which is it very much depends on what you include as your frame of reference for asking what good looks like, or even just observing. So it's inputs, outputs, outcomes. It's a. It, it, I think there's a question here of changing the nature of the question being asked. If it's and perhaps it's a little bit a question of behaving like a um, a form of a of kind of guerrilla guerrilla or hacking tactics, use an established framework, but embed it with a different way of asking quest different questions to ask, a different way of of embodying or embedding criteria, and a different way of looking and inquiring into outcomes. There's there's nothing intrinsically um, blocking 
in, within uh, within a policy framework to work differently if you're asking for a set of outcomes to be measured or observed in the terms in which we know enough about integrated landscape management to be able to embed. I think the biggest tension sits with what Emil was describing, where you have um, direct clashes and const uh, on contrasts on policy. We have two kind of bodies of policy that are fundamentally in tension and incentives that are fundamentally at, at odds with one another, like subsidies to one thing that are really undermining another thing. But that's not going to be manageable within one framework. That needs to be an effect of getting a framework to go in the right direction and then naming where you have a set of externalities that are going to systematically um, undermine the, um, a virtuous or, or a positive outcome. And for me, then, there really is a question on how do you start to work? In our experience, this is about beginning to work explicitly with governments and with industries on, for example, policy sandboxing that starts to embed the opportunity for working differently into a context where policymakers are asked to really look and understand how would you change the way policy has been designed to make it possible to do this work and not continually undermine or contrast it. But I think there is much that could be done by coming to existing frameworks and, and layering them up with a very different set of questions and expectations and kind of running that. It's like embedding into the existing financial rulemaking questions of and maybe mm. I give a very concrete example from financial services and um, where I used to work uh, for some time in the past. When you embed into international financial rulemaking, the notion of institutions that are too systemically important to fail, which is what happened in the wake of the financial crisis, you suddenly opened up a space for understanding that systemic was something that institutions need to become good at doing and thinking in terms of systemic outcomes and effects needed to be something they took on, which they never had to really think about. So you can actually use the existing system as long as you start embedding with it with a different set of things that it, it is asking for, and you open up a space for different practices. I could like to add something to that as well, uh, if I might, Nate. Um, 20 years ago, when we first started, you were still in a situation in much of the world where governments were antagonistic to landscape partnerships. They perceived them as trying to take over something that was a prerogative of government. Um, that has changed quite dramatically in most, not all, but in most countries of the world. I think with the introduction of the sustainability development goals, where there's a push for integration uh, with the integration at the United Nations level of trying to get integration between the different, the different sectors. Um, I think in climate change has opened up a lot of openness to having to work across sectors because there was no, there's no, you know, most places don't have a climate ministry, so they have to work across it. So I think the situation is actually much better than it used to be. It's just not where it needs to be. But uh, it, it, it's, we still need specialists. We need people who are expert in each one of these areas. It's not necessarily so bad that we have different ministries. The only problem is if they assume they don't need to talk to anybody else about what they're doing. But if the ministry takes as a matter of course that if they're going to put a program together, they're going to jointly design it with people from other ministries, all of a sudden you've got something. You, you, you certainly can work with it. And the new generation of people who've been trained to understand the relationship between agriculture and ecosystems and social systems are having a much easier time of doing this, I think, than, than their elders did. Maybe also just make the connection on the economic case, because if you can talk to what Emil was describing on health care benefits, on we're in, a, in an increasingly resource constrained environment, it becomes very attractive if one initiative manages to create a whole lot of saves across sectors and a whole lot of benefits, that case can be made. Maybe just one word to add. Uh, I think one thing that has to change also is to pay much more attention to bottom-up approaches. Too much has been still in a top-down way where uh, things are uh, thought, developed, uh, without really involving the people that will be affected by the policies and the actions that are on the ground. So paying much more attention to the involvement uh, and empowerment of the farmers communities on the ground and uh, also greater attention to peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, approaches that really take into consideration the, the, the local realities uh, much more. So I, I'll just leave it at that.
So one, one last point that I wanted to mention, I think in, in our work across, you know, Africa, Asia, and Latin America, one thing that we find um, very interesting is the difference between very devolved, decentralized governments or countries and very centralized countries. We find it extremely, you know, much, much easier to go in with the landscape approach in highly devolved, you know, uh, 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 settings where you have more federal government, where you have more devolution, and, and where at lower levels of government, they are allowed to do their integrated development plans. You know, that, that becomes much easier to have some integration at that sort of landscape scale, especially where there is a convergence between you know, the sub-national level of government with some autonomy in planning, you know, and implementation vis-a-vis -vis areas where you still have more central planning. That really is an advantage for us, and we really use that, and it's worked pretty nicely. Wonderful, thank you. So here's another question. Um, we often run into the problem of lacking institutional support what are some flexible support systems available for practitioners, researchers, farmers, so that we can move from institution, institution silos to systems? Well, in this area, I would really recommend looking at the, bio, the bioregional weaving labs. It's actually entirely set up to create that kind of resource base and, and, and kind of tools, practices, best practices. I'll be turning to you, Sarah. Of a thousand landscapes in many ways is doing is is doing exactly that, um, creating those kinds of precedents um, that is bringing practitioners, research examples, cases, and the kind of context of live learning. I do personally. I would reflect from the experience that Klamakik has in engaging and supporting initiatives like Thousand Landscapes, engaging in work across watersheds or work across forestry. Um, there is, it's important to tease out and, and think about formal and informal institutional systems. Uh, there, are in, there are formal institutional support systems um, to some extent, and I think that will increasingly become more so. And we've been talking about ways in which or where you can look for, as Peter is saying, where you have devolved, more devolved environments, you've got more possibility for doing that and working with that. Um, but there's also a lot of informal institutional support in communities of practice um, and in creating an explicit understanding that this is about learning by doing and inquiring an embodied understanding of what this looks like and how it works that can be then be built with, built by, and kind of exchanged and enabled with others. That is incredibly form of institutional support as well. It doesn't doesn't look like a formal school education, but it's amazingly powerful. So actively designing for that, creating some space to support it, being explicit about this is what's happening, I think is is really very, very important. Yeah. I mean, what we've learned about landscape, one of the things we've learned at Eco Agriculture Partners about landscape partnerships um, is that the leaders in them, all, even if they're from very different agriculturally ecosystems and very different contexts, they will, they face a lot of the same challenges of involving people and institutions. And they most like to learn from other people who are do doing the same thing. They most like to learn from other landscape partnerships. And we found that uh, that regional dialogues, national dialogues, and we're particularly excited about this this idea of national coalitions of landscape partnerships and their allies who can come together and, and actually address some of the issues, share what they've learned. And we're also trying to provide these other resources that can be accessed online um, uh, you know, for free. 1,000 Landscapes for 1 billion people is committed to open source, open access work, that they can actually download resource materials and adapt them. They can download the software code and change the code so it meets the things that they need. So what we're not trying to do is hand people things. We're trying to have them tools so they can create the version of this that makes sense for their place and for their, their institutions. 
And so, you know, we're very excited. We're trying different things with, with government agencies, with NGOs, with, with, with farmer groups, with, with landscape networks to see how they can institutionalize this in the places that they're working and co-create it with existing institutions and supplement existing institutions. So we, we think you don't necessarily need a whole new set of, set of things, but um, we need to be really smart about this and not use old fashioned mechanisms for, for institutional development. Wonderful. So we have we have uh, one last question, and I'm uh, just for brevity of time as we're wrapping up. I'm just going to ask one of you to to answer it. So whoever's feeling feeling the most uh, able to do so would be great. Um, so this person asks, "How can we sell businesses on the idea of ILM? What is the what is the benefit for them for both small scale local businesses and cafes, but also large companies like Nestle? What about the fashion industry? So how do you sell those businesses on the idea of ILM?" Um, I mean, for me, I think, uh, frankly, if you look at deforestation-free commodities, Nestle wouldn't have any viable uh, uh, product if we don't take a landscape approach to, 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 to things, because you can only have deforestation-free commodities if there is some concerted action between agriculture and forestry and planning and, you know, and, and, and ministries of commerce, as opposed to doing it in, on the farm only, that wouldn't work. So I think, I think from a business perspective, there is interest in securing supply chains, greening supply chains via a landscape approach. It is the only way at the moment where you can actually produce anything deforestation free, climate smart in, in whatever sense that is. I'll stop. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Oh, Kirsten, did you uh, wanted to add add on to that? I just saw you unmuted. Okay. It's just survival. <laughs> you want to survive, you're going to need something like this. Is a, a recent study by CDP, one of our 1,000 landscape partners, uh, on, on which was showing a very large number of, of corporates that have already have, are already starting to work in this space. I think most of them mm -hmm. are working a bit experimentally in it. They're trying to figure out how can they can be part of a landscape partnership. How can they work with landscape partnerships? But there's a lot of concern about sourcing. There's a lot of concern about all sorts of kinds of risk that can potentially be addressed through strong landscape partnerships. That actually is appealing. Uh, to businesses. And I think they've also learned from the last 10 years of experience that they it doesn't make sense for them to try to take over these landscape partnerships. For a while, some of them tried to do that, and they've learned that doesn't really work for them. Um, but I, I, I think we're moving in that direction. We should move faster, but uh, it'll be be very interesting. Great. Yeah, there, there are a lot of uh, interesting examples in Italy, where I live, uh, of bio districts and the way that they have been working together uh, but in the interest of time, I, I, I don't want to give more details, but I think for people interested, uh, they can find out more about these examples of, of really successful uh, work together. Perfect. So before we end, I want each of you to share one last brief, short, inspiring message to to uh, the audience about your work and about ILM. And Emil, we'll, we'll start with you. Well, first of all, I want to say that I've been very pleased to be working with Eco Agriculture Partners almost right from the beginning. And I've been a, a member, a vice chair, and finally chair of the board of directors. And I've been very, very proud of uh, being part of, of this wonderful organization. Um, I, As a conclusion, I think that uh, for the success <clears throat> to be there, we really have to be transformative. I think we have been saying that incremental changes are not going to do the trick. We need to rethink. And within a, a, a landscape approach, agroecology principles are really important guidance to get the level of transformation that is needed to, to move towards uh, really sustainable, resilient, and socially equitable uh, um, uh, landscapes and, and, and food systems. So I think uh, that's... Uh, an important guidance that can be provided for that that aspect of an integrated landscape management. Perfect. Kirsten? I'd also echo we are we are at a celebratory event. Um, 
congratulating Eco Agriculture Partners on, on an anniversary. And I think leadership demonstration, showing that it's possible, leading by doing, is an enormously powerful intervention for unlocking transformation. And I would really want to celebrate and thank the efforts of Sarah and the Eco Agricultural Partners for doing that. For me, the, the reflection is this is about interdependence and uh, humility, and one of the comments in the chat from uh, from Thomas, one of the, uh, has, has around how we retrain ourselves to stop thinking in terms of zero sum games, dominance over, but partnership with, interdependence with, um, and harmony with, that can be often said, but making it practical, grounding it, putting it on the ground and putting people and species around that is a very different thing. I think that's really what we're here talking about. How do you make it real and practical and enduring? Wonderful. Thank you. Peter? Oh, thanks. I mean, a wonderful, wonderful joy working with Eco Agriculture Partners, you know, innovating together, you know, trying to work, as, as Sarah mentioned, on this measurement at landscape level monitoring. It's been, and many, many other aspects, I think it's been really great. I have personally enjoyed it. Um, and, and I'm looking forward to, to doing that. So wonderful job, Sarah and the team, and, and keep doing what you're doing. Um, for me, um, one main thing that I, if there's one message that I'll, I'd like to pass on, I think I fully support what Emil said and what, you know, Kristen said. I think one of the things that we're finding interesting in, in our work as we review things over the last 25 years that I've been in this business, We've done great with looking at biodiversity aspects of landscapes, in, in landscape. We've done great looking at the social dimensions of landscapes. I think where we are lagging behind a little bit is looking at the economic aspects of landscapes, looking at how landscapes can actually lift people out of poverty. In the poor places where we work, if we don't make an effort to make sure that poverty is taken care of, I think that for the most part, we will be lagging behind in bringing everyone together and achieving the sustainability that we want to, we want to achieve. So I would make an appeal for, for us to really try to bring that aspect and build on it as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll let uh, Sarah, you can have the last word. Sure, and I'll make it a very short one. I first of all want to thank uh, the panelists for coming, who are old, and some newer friends and colleagues who've been inspirations to me as I've been trying to think through these very difficult things and come up with a strategy. I want to thank all of the people who came to this event. I think you're all landscape champions and landscape leaders, and I, I wish you all the best of luck and the really ambitious and exciting work that you're all doing in your own organizations. And I hope you'll stay in touch with Eco Agriculture Partners um, as we as we move forward um, into these next 20 years. Thank you, Nate.